they truly are playing the compounding game of just wait every year, make more sales, drive more growth. Like it is very possible that within the next decade to 15 years, they will be a trillion dollar company. Well, hello, and welcome to another edition of the e-commerce evolution podcast. I'm your host, Brett Curry, CEO of OMG Commerce. And today I've got a return guest. This dude is smart. He's blowing up on LinkedIn. Everyone's talking about him and commenting on his posts and signing up for his newsletter. But I got Jeremy Horowitz back with me today. He's the founder of Let's Buy a Biz. Check it out at letsbuyabiz.xyz. Love that top level domain, by the way. But today we're talking about businesses we would buy versus businesses we wouldn't. And I am so excited to dive into this. But Jeremy, welcome to the show, man. And, and how's it going? Thanks, Brett. It's great to be back. I always love jumping on the OMG podcast and catching up. Things are going really well. Uh, I think, you know, I'm sure we'll dive into this in a little bit, but it's a great time to be in e-commerce. I know it's been a slog mm -hmm. for a lot of brands the past couple of years. We rode the roller coaster of COVID up. We rode the post-COVID pullback down. And then now it feels like we're kind of starting to level set back to somewhat, you know, there's no such thing as normal, but it feels like predictable and understandable growth again. Um, so yeah, really excited to dive back into everything. I know that, you know, we usually talk about big predictions, the big bold bets, and I have some of those today. But also just really excited to talk about, like, for someone who wants to exit a business, what does that look like, especially from the vantage point of someone who looks at acquiring a business all the time and then has that operational background of, you know, what would we go do if we were to go acquire and run that business? Yeah, I love that so much. And and so to, to kind of the first point, it's a great time to be in e-commerce. I 100% agree. We've had kind of four years strung together of very abnormal uh, economic and societal and, and health you know, uh, stuff going on. And so it does feel like we're we're reaching maybe a new normal that I think can be very healthy. I was talking about it with uh, my buddy, Sean Frank from The Ridge and there, and he said the same thing. He feels like this is going to be a year of more stability for e-com and it's just a bright time, man. Think, things are growing. We're gonna look at kind of the global picture of e-com. You got some good data that we'll, we'll unpack. And so that's super interesting. And I mean, I, I love this perspective of let's buy a biz because as we look at some of these things at a bare minimum, this is going to help you build and operate a better business. Even if you're like, I'm building this for the long haul. That's what Sean at the, the Ridge is doing. I'm building this for the long haul. It's going to be a cash cow. I'm just going to take massive distributions as I grow this thing to multiple millions in EBITDA every year. Uh, or I want to have an exit. And and I, you know, you know, I, before we hit record, we we're talking about our journey. Like we're actively looking to acquire other agencies, right? We're actively looking at MA half for about two years. And, and it's a super fun space, um, but but so many benefits, even if you never buy or sell, lots of benefits to this discussion. And so uh, let's let's first start with kind of the, the, the data that backs up. It's a great time to be in e-commerce. I know you've got some interesting data uh, looking at Amazon and Shopify from kind of a gross a GMV you know, perspective. But but yeah, what, what is exciting to you about Amazon and Shopify and just the, the state of e-com? Yeah. So I think the first thing, and so for quick context, where this all comes from is every week I go through a public company's P&L and their 10K and then basically tear it down. What would I do if I ran this biz? What does the financials look like? How can we really get this to the next level? All your usual suspects, Lululemon, uh, LVMH, all those types of brands. And I also like to look at the, the biggest boys and girls in the space who primarily shop find Amazon. And when you look at their 2023 earnings, they did $936 billion in estimated GMV between Amazon and Shop Shopify alone. Insane. So you're thinking about all the sales on Amazon, all the sales on Shopify. It's going to cross a trillion, trillion dollars. dollars. <laughs> yeah, it's going to officially cross a trillion dollars in mm -hmm. consumer spending in those two categories. And then when you take a bigger step back and you think of the total, at least U.S. market, as a percentage of consumer spending, e-commerce in total is about 15%. So right. still 85 cents out of every dollar is still spent in physical retail. And these two companies are going to do a trillion dollars in total sales on their platforms across, you know, it's very, very different between Amazon, the 1P, 3P, and then also Shopify and all the new areas that they spend and they play in. But Amazon's GMV is growing at 11% year over year. Shopify's is growing at 19% year over year. And when you just think about the raw, t like just raw tonnage of dollars, like how many Brinks trucks need to drive through to a bank 
for a trillion dollars in GMB, which is going to be even more than that this year. Like it's a great. Well, I'd say it's a tough two cities. Like, what, what, how much money can a Brinks truck hold? I think that that's something that's worth unpacking. Ooh, yeah, that's a good Google. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna Google that. How much cash? A Brinks truck. Um, yeah. So how many of those would it take? It uh, looks like four to six, four to six million dollars, according to Google, if I'm looking at the right thing. So that's a lot of that's a lot of Brinks trucks. So yeah, that's a fleet. Yeah, fleet of Brinks trucks, and so. What I would say is, I would say it's a tale of two cities of e-commerce growing. <clears throat> it's growing really well and it's growing really fast. I would say maybe where I may take a nuance or a counterpoint to Sean's point is, I don't know if it's going to be stable. And I actually think it's a really interesting tumultuous time where it's great for e com The trend line is going up. But I think with the current economic conditions and everything that's happened with interest rates, you know, like kind of three big bull bets for this year is it's going to be a wider valley between the haves and the haves not in the spaces. I think a lot of consumers are just kind of going back to their familiar brands, going back to the places that you see. Like you, see, you I, I don't know if you also look at the earnings of like fast food chains over the past six to 12 months. The fast not. food is killing it. You know, really? everybody tried to get healthy during COVID. Everybody tried to eat better. And now everybody wants those like kind of, you know, indulgences and guilty pleasures. Comfort and food so, and it's a little more predictable cost to really like eating healthy yeah. can be more expensive. And so inflation has been a real thing. Maybe I'm saving a little bit of money and I'm getting some comfort along the way with some Mickey D's or some Chick-fil-A or something. Yeah, exactly. Just not Wendy's because apparently they're going to change their prices more fast than Uber does upcoming. <laughs> but um, I think that's a major part. I think the other big piece and, you know, coming as someone who wrote a couple of early stage checks over the past three years, like VC funding is not coming back. And private yeah. equity, com- private equity is not really coming back in the same way. And you know, there's a whole complex macroeconomic reason for all of that. But valuations are not what they used to be, and things like that. And that's not, yeah. that's likely not going to return. Yeah, yeah. Like the amount of dollars flowing in through those sources and the valuations are just gross, are just really, really different. And then also, unfortunately, we are just seeing a lot of M and A's and bankruptcies from the people who dig out too far out over their skis over the past couple of years. Are now, you know, those loans are coming to maturity. They need to figure out how to pay back all of that debt. So I'd say like for the brands that kept, and I know we're going to kind of dive into like good biz, bad biz, but like for the brands that really kept clean, they didn't take on too much debt. They didn't over hire or take on too much inventory and really stayed in that good, healthy place. This is a great opportunity where things can really just pop off. You need to just find that one good channel, that one right product. And then things really can because go very well because the, the dollars are coming in. Like the customers are spending the money. I would say it's probably the greatest time to be like a 20 to $200 million biz and up. It's probably really hard to be a new business. Like you probably have to be very unique to stand out now just because ad rates have gotten so competitive. But I will say like, I, I mean, I've been very long in this industry. I've spent basically a decade plus in this industry and uh, most in the Shopify space. And like, I think it's only going to get better but you really need to be a lot smarter. I think the aperture and like the window has closed a little bit where it's not everybody can get through anymore. It's like you need to be a lot more precise in how to build a proper e-commerce and physical products business. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the, yeah, the stakes for winning are bigger, right? The overall pie is expanding. It's at e at 50% of total retail, but that's only going to increase but I, I like the way you said that, yeah, the valley between the haves and the have nots, it's widening and will likely continue. And so, uh, yeah, I, I fully agree. I think there's mountains of opportunities this year, uh, both for e-commerce brands, for agencies, for those that support the e-com space, but, but some challenges too, right? And so one thing that's been interesting, I've seen this trend and, and I'm curious, you know, what your perspective has been. But, you know, there, there was this this grow at all costs during the height of COVID. And then there was a we're figuring out ship again and other supply chain issues. We're just figuring it out. Right. All these other things. There is there is definitely a renewed interest in just profitability. Right. E-commerce companies saying we need growth. We need marketing. We need to, you know, customer acquisition. But we just got to be profitable. And, and there's definitely like this this uh, ruthless quest to be profitable like i'll fire my mom you know to be to be profitable whatever like that that's that's the sense i'm getting from e-commerce brands and and i think that's i think that's healthy right like that's the way that the industry needs to go yeah and i think the interesting thing because i know you and i have been from like you know the pre-2018 2019 super boom 
Yeah. That's what this game has always been about. <laughs> like it's always been about profitable growth. And I would say for sure, for sure. we had like a temporary, uh, you know, people move the goalposts a little bit and we've kind of returned back to normal, but you know, the goal has always been profitable growth. And I think looking through, I've looked about through about 31 public company brands and that's every valuation, right? We can talk about pre uh, price to earnings ratio, PE ratios. We can talk about revenue multiples. Everyone on Wall Street is just, are you, how much growth do you have? And is that growth profitable? And, yeah. you know, the past couple of years, they would really, you know, if you're not that profitable, okay, you know, we'll give you a little leeway. Now it is just no mercy. You either are profitable or you are not. And then are you growing and how fast are you growing? And yeah. Erlen is also kind of returns that, you know, you're hearing people talk about Warren Buffett a lot more recently than a couple of years ago, instead of people, you know, on Twitter talking about Bitcoin. Um, as for financial advice and, you know, like how much, how much future cash is this business going to throw I'm off? so glad we're, we're you know, moving away from Bitcoin to more Buffett. Like <laughs> we need more Buffett, uh, a little less Bitcoin talk, whatever. You know. I feel like it's a, it's a, it's a 10 year cycle where everybody moves away from Buffett. They forget the good fundamentals yeah. and they come back and, and boring. It's so old again. school. All we need is this, you know, crypto. That's how we'll be yeah. a billion. Um, but yeah, right. Like. And I think like this is probably a, a good way to think about, and I think more e-com operators need to think this way, is your business is worth the amount of cash it throws off at the end of the day after all of your expenses. And I think a really important piece there is like, you should think like an investor, like, you know, you should do the analysis every quarter, every year, how much is that cash throwing off? How much is that worth? And then do your own analysis of, you know, what we call a discounted cash flow, but you can do it personally of like, hey, I made a million dollars in net income this year. Should I put that back into the business? Should I take half a million dollars and go on a crazy vacation, buy a sports car, put a down payment on a home? Like, you know, as the owner of the business, that is like you are the biggest investor in it. And so thinking through that and thinking through how you want to operate your money, like usually operating cash from your business is really important instead of just always grow, always grow, always grow. And then that's also what will determine the value of your business when you exit, right? Because the bigger the the bigger that pile of money is the more someone else is willing to give you their pile of money to take on the future cash flow from your business. Love it. So we're, we're, we're going to unpack here in a minute, you know, businesses we buy versus businesses we wouldn't. It's kind of like the, the hot or not, I guess, of, of businesses. And so we're going <laughs> to make, make that analysis. But uh, before we do that, though, you know, you've looked at so many companies and, and you, you've been in the VC space, and you know, private equity peeps, uh, as do I. Let's, let's set some benchmarks, you know, for a healthy, profitable, growing e-com business. What should we look at in general in terms of like constructing a PL? Now, obviously, on a podcast, if I'm going to go every single line item of PL, that would be a little bit boring. But but from a you know larger context, how do we construct a healthy PL for e-com? Yeah. So I'm going to keep it super high level. And this is also actually how public companies have to report their P&L. So it's probably a good practice to start doing the fundamentals now. Like, obviously, don't go through gap accounting and pay E&Y $500,000 to your books this year. But just really simply what you should be reviewing every month, if not even more frequently, definitely every quarter every year. Start with your revenue, right? How much total net sales did the business bring in? Then what are your costs of goods sold to get to gross profit? Hope everybody who's listening to this podcast super familiar with that part. Really comfortable, right? How much are we make? How much are we keeping after, you know, what it, we outweighed to buy the product? Then from there, you want to break out OPEX. Now, I think this is the trickiest part. And I've seen after analyzing close to 300 e-com P&Ls over the past couple of years, where this just goes all over the place. So I'm going to give you Amazon structure because if it's good enough for Amazon, it's probably good enough for your biz. Good enough is, for Uncle Jack, probably good enough for us, you know? Yes, right. So marketing and sales. Right. That should be pretty straightforward. What are you spending to get people to buy your product? Then your GNA. So, right. Your rent, your team. Administrative. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Just all of the back end stuff to keep the business going. Your fulfillment and supply chain. And then if you have it, your R and D. And why it's super important to break those four key components out. And what I see so much of the time is people will bundle in SGNA or they'll bundle in fulfillment into GNA as well is really all an e-com business is, is how much of money do I spend on marketing to get someone to buy something? And how much does it cost me to make it and get it to someone? And yeah. you really want to break those two things out because 
no offense to all the three PLs and people who fulfill, but you are almost always losing money in that part of your business. And then really where the most cash is probably going to come out of your business is in marketing and sales. And so, right, there's a huge fluctuation, and I'm sure you probably know better than I do, but depending on where a brand is and their growth curve and how much they want to grow, that is really going to be the biggest lever and the biggest place where you push or pull back. Whereas, you know, you may not like, you may not love your 3PL and they may be charging you 15% of your revenue to ship out a product, but you're not pulling that back tomorrow or you're not pulling that back next week. And so you really need to understand like, where are my softer and where are my harder expenses? Because yeah. at the end of the day, everything that I see is that is what makes or breaks the profitability of an e-commerce company. I, I know every e-com brand is going to be a little bit different. And, you know, we have a lot of visibility, obviously, into the the marketing and advertising spend with, with our clients as, a, as an agency. Uh, you know, and, and often that's 25, 30 percent of revenue that, that's going right back into to marketing and advertising. I know it varies for uh, every e-com brand. What are some benchmarks from your perspective? Like where should these percentages be with the caveat that it could be different a little bit from business to business, but, but what, what are the, the benchmarks? Yeah. So I think this is a really interesting, like, especially when I was earlier in my career, there's always seemed to be like words of wisdom that I always ask like, Hey, where did you get that math from? And it was just yeah. always the, this is how it is. And now I've actually pulled enough data <laughs> to know like it does revert. It kind of reverts back to this like consistent. It, it is how it is. Yeah. yeah. So I, I would say like, if you want to be a top tier brand that can really grow and scale and get to significant level 50, 100, 200 billions of dollars in revenue, you want to target about a 50 to 60% gross margin. Now I've seen some super successful brands that can dip down into the 30, 40% and then some crazy high brands that are up in the 80s. Meaning sales, less cogs, so exactly. sales, less cogs. Yeah. 50 to 60% gross margin. Yeah. So, right. So once you get to your gross margin, I think that's, that's the most important determinant for yep. your brand because that will determine your entire strategy. And what's really interesting also is, you know, it's kind of just a function of math. If you only have 40% of your revenue after your cogs to spend, you're probably not going to spend as much on marketing as if you were you can't 80 spend 30% on marketing at that point, right? Then you're, yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, you can, <laughs> or, or you can, but it's, yeah. 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 Right. Like it's, it's a much, it's a much, it's much tougher to spend 30% of your marketing at that level versus if you're an 80% gross margin brand, you can spend 30% and you still have 50% of your revenue to go spend on fulfillment operations, SGNA. And so it really is interesting how it shifts and changes. I would say there's usually what I call like the pop dip and then rise on SGNA. So right. Your team really, really high growth, top tier brands, can usually get to about 10 million on five people. I haven't really seen it on fewer. There are some brands who can do it on like two or three, but you know, that's truly special unicorn edge case. Definitely. So like usually around 10 million in GMV, you're probably at like maybe five people with a bunch of agencies and other yeah, freelance resources. Stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so your SGNA can be super, super low. Like a lot of super high growth brands that I see, their SGNA is around, especially up into that 10, 20 million in GMV usually about 5% of their revenue. Now that will then grow over time. So as you get to 20, 50, 100 million, you will have to hire a lot more people. And then when you go to a public scale, it's usually somewhere around 50 to 20%, unless you're like Warby Parker and Allbirds and then you're at 40 or 50% and you're not making any net income. So that's a super important component. I would say fulfillment is usually around 10 to 15% of revenue. And this is the one area that I think is super important to break out from your SGNA of like, how can you whittle that down? Right. Because every, every percentage point there could be going to marketing, could be going to bottom line, could be going to all these other areas. And I don't know, from what I've seen, economies of scale is, I mean, nobody's really figured out economies of scale and fulfillment for e-commerce yet. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's another major component. And then where it always nets down to, and what's to me the most interesting is a lot of the retail OGs and people who are really successful building like malls, physical brick and mortar retail presences, always said your net income is going to net out at 10 to 15% of your revenue. Mm -hmm. And it, it holds true. The DVC darlings, the retail heavy brands, the hybrids, it all, I mean, it all will fluctuate but you kind of always net out at 10 to 15% of every dollar you make in top line nets out as net income. And it's a really interesting trend and also makes it like, it's kind of, that's probably the best benchmark. Everything in the middle, your gross margins, your OPEX is going to fluctuate based on your business and your dynamics. 
but you kind of always want to net out at that 10 to 15% of net income. You know, if you want to be high, if you want to take out more cash out of the business, raise it. If you're comfortable with growth, you can lower it. But it really seems to be that like words of wisdom that really does always net out in the data. Got it. And, and yeah, maybe if you are in the and in the agency world, you know, we're we're generally seeing, you know, the high teens to say 24 percent, kind of that that window is what a lot of agencies shoot for. And and PE groups, we know they kind of specialize in agencies. That's kind of what they look for. But it's still not far off from what you just said. But the idea there is, yeah, if you if you take a higher percentage of profits, then you're you're likely pulling away from something that that's going to impact future growth. Right. So you're pulling away from from marketing or sales or R&D or something to get to get to that um, higher margin. Are, are you seeing many of the uh, kind of e-com rock star businesses that are hitting 20 percent net income or that that's pretty rare? That's very rare. And I actually think the interesting thing that um, the interesting thing that I'm also seeing and hearing a little bit of through the rumor mill is like a lot of financial companies don't want you to be that high. They actually it means, want, not, it means you're not hitting the accelerator hard enough, right? It means you're not advertising enough. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the, why, the reason I always look at this as a percentages in a pie is you got to take something from somewhere else to put yes. it in another pocket. And when you think about an e-com business, like your COGS and your fulfillment costs are, you know, fixed isn't a proper accounting word, but they're a lot harder to move, right? You buy your product, you commit to those prices, you ship it. You're kind of committed to those things. So really when most brands want to take more profit out of the business, they're cutting their marketing or they're cutting their GNA, which is team or their variable marketing spend, which is almost always, you know, an investment in growth. I will yep. say the one caveat for the past couple of years is a lot of people just overhired and just brought on too many people. And you're seeing, you know, a lot of, unfortunately the layoffs are pretty painful and tough, but also, you know, Shopify went, you know, got dragged in the markets for their rounds. And they had no, they reduced their SGNA by 31% year over year and had no meaningful impact on their business. And so I think that's also a little bit of like market dynamics and corrections of people got a little too high on the hog in 2020, 2021. And now we just need to get back to everybody getting in shape and getting fit. Yeah. And, and I think it's just healthy, right? And this, this is something that, that every business needs. We've, we've got these benchmarks and we're going to ruthlessly uh, attack those. And so right sizing. Yeah. I mean, it was easy for e-com businesses and agencies. Like we all went through this period. Shopify did it right. Uh, just adding too many, you know, getting a uh, head count way too high uh, for what you really needed. And so the right sizing is painful, but necessary for sure. So um, awesome, man. So love that. Um, not everybody likes to talk about a PL, but come on, like that's, that's poetry in motion, baby. When you've got a good PL for your business, you're, you're hitting that 10 to 15% net income, you're growing. That's a beautiful business and it's attractive if you want to sell it or if you just want to cash flow it, uh, you're likely really good. So uh, let's do it, man. Let, let's kind of buy this business. Would we buy this business? Would we not buy this business? Uh, who's kind of first on the list for us to break down? Yeah. So my favorite one that I looked at and kind of actually where I started this whole journey was Crocs. Um, and Crocs is such, yeah, a such fascinating an odd industry. resurgence, such an odd resurgence post COVID. Everybody's like, yeah, they're ugly, but I love it. And it makes me feel good. And so I'm going to wear it. And uh, I, I, lo I love this trend. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they were they were probably too early to the comfort economy. And then, yeah, COVID was a really good bump for them. So just a quick stats on Crocs. They're currently trading $124 a share. They have a market cap of $7.5 billion. Um, and when you look at their revenue and net income, they're trading at essentially two times their revenue and 9.7 times their, what's called the PE ratio, which is basically just what is their net income? What is their market cap divided by their net income, which is 9.7 times. Why I always like to look at this and I look at both SaaS and e-com businesses is really important is I feel like too many headlines recently have been this company traded at X on their revenue. Yeah, like like 30, or 30X earnings or 15X revenue or something. And it's like, yeah, that, that should only apply to a few business categories and not e-com. Yeah. And I think the difference is, is, you know, if you're an 80% gross margin business and you have high recurring revenue, you know, investors will give you the leeway of saying, okay, this will be a multiple of revenue versus, in, you know, we just talked about it in e-com business. There's all of these other expenses that are pretty tied to the business. So I think a really important level set there is to always look at what are the PE ratios of public e-com companies, because that's actually the determinant that the financial players are using to get to whatever that market cap should be. But 
Crocs is a really strong business. They're doing $3.9 billion in revenue in 2023. Uh, they have $1.7 billion in COGS. So they're at about a 56% gross margin. And they did about $2.2 billion in gross profits. They have an SGA of $1.1 billion, which puts them at about 30% of their revenue, which they actually are at 20% net income. So wow. when you think about that, you know, it's the silly brand that everybody loves to make fun of, but they really are building a meaningful business. And every year, because I've been, I've been posting with them for a couple of years now, every year everybody's like, oh, it's just a COVID fad. They'll slow down. They're growing just as fast as they did before COVID. And they actually have this brilliant business model, which I call ludicrous stunt collabs. Um, so I don't know if everybody remembers like the Balenciaga croc from a couple of years ago they do they in 2022 they did over 66 collabs with different celebrities and different huge other brands like hello kitty crocs and all these other yep, things yep. they're doubling down they did even more than that in 2023 and it's a really i think it's also just a really good lesson in creative marketing as well mm -hmm. is you know they make plastic clogs that are i guess are super comfy i don't own a pair but you know i guess they're super comfy but they're, really, they're, 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 I've owned a pair in forever, but they are comfortable. Okay. Um, yeah, everyone I know owns them. Like, I am the outlier in my in my social network for not having a pair of Crocs. Um, but yeah, I think it's a really compelling and really interesting business case where I think the other really important part is they're a traditional legacy retail brand that then also had a kind of a renaissance of e-commerce. And now the two are really blending the business model. They've really found a good way to blend those business models well together. I think the other thing that I really want to make sure kind of this little period ends is this whole DTC or die mania of just, it has to be DTC. We have to go to a hundred million, two, so, 500 million, whatever direct to consumer. Like, no, if you make a product, your job is to sell that product in as many channels as possible through different vehicles. Some of those will be owned. Some of those will be rented. Some of those will be partnered. And I think they're one of the best examples of like just really running the playbook well and always having something fresh because really they don't have that many problems. Like, yes, they've extended in some other categories, but to me, that's like a really, really strong business where it's not a massive product catalog, right? They don't have 15,000, 20,000 SKUs, but they're selling in multiple places. They're striving. Yeah, they're on Amazon. I wasn't, I wasn't sure, but they're, they're selling on Amazon and they've got a, a pretty, yeah. pretty awesome Amazon store. I think that was one of their, like, I think that was a COVID, you know, we need to get on Amazon because we have to shut our physical retail down. And now uh -huh. they don't break out their Amazon in their earnings, but I, I would assume Amazon is a meaningful part of their business now. And, uh -huh. you know, their digital presence between D2C and Amazon is a bit of a flywheel that also then fuels their retail business as well. Did you get the Hello Kitty collab, the NASCAR Crocs you got? other stuff that I don't even understand what I'm looking at. <laughs> and I think that's actually a really, I think that's also part of the brilliance of the strategy is like, you know, it's the same product, but <laughs> yeah. the designs are bringing in different customers where, you know, I'm going to go on a limb and assume that the Hello Kitty crowd is not the same as a NASCAR crowd. People are probably <laughs> buying their NASCAR product, probably aren't buying their Hello Kitty product and vice versa. Um, and I think that's like a really brilliant design way to acquire more customers. Now I'd say on the flip side, let's take a brilliant yeah, marketing step. more, right? Cause so, so but now, now maybe if I'm a NASCAR fan and I've got a daughter, I'm going to buy her Hello Kitty or uh, there's, there's the Pixar uh, uh, integration, you know, some of this, like the, the, uh, um, the Woody, you know, uh, Croc here uh, from, from Toy Story. Yeah. So just, just brilliant. Yeah. Now I'd say on the flip side, a different example of, you know, brilliant marketing use case that didn't work out of not buying a biz would be solo, solo brands. Yeah. So I know everybody loves to beat up on them. They had a pretty tough quarter. I think the more important piece here is really diving into why that business didn't work. So for anyone who isn't familiar, solo brands is a essentially a portfolio company of four different DTC companies. The largest one is solo stove. So this is, Kind of basically the yeti of fire pits it's a portable fire pit super high end targeting the outdoorsy people who you know want to do campfires grill marshmallows they acquired shubbies the short shorts company huge fashion like you know shopify 1.0 d2c darling then they also acquired oru kayak and isle paddleboard so you know very much trying to live the outdoor lifestyle you know big products people buy I think here's my two main problems with it. First, Chubby's makes no sense in that product portfolio. Like 
you know, I'm not the customer, so I'll take this with a grain of salt, but someone who bought, I can't just imagine someone going like, you know, camping, bringing their solo stove and their Oru kayak while wearing their like American flag overall short shorts from Chuggies. Like I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to see that being the same customer base, but I think the other bigger component is like, we have to stop shipping heavy stuff. Like it just doesn't make sense. They're an unprofitable business. They actually like had a pretty painful year over year net loss. And then obviously bring them up because of the whole Snoop Dogg thing. I think it was brilliant marketing. I don't think it was the right strategy at the right time. Yeah, I mean, I mean it, it, that that whole uh, you know I, I'm giving up smoke uh, from Snoop Dogg. Brilliant. Yeah. I think the execution was really interesting as well. It, it didn't work maybe for a few reasons, but but yeah, quick quick note on that. Like I, I met uh, one of the founders of Solo of the Solo Stove. Brilliant guy, just awesome guy. I know a couple of the founders from Chubby's, also brilliant guys. Really cool brands. But yeah, there's been some challenges and maybe some missteps uh, along the way. And everybody does sort of love to hate on them, which probably isn't totally fair. But to your point, really good lessons here as we as we unpack them. And I think, yeah, to your point, um, like I love Chubby's and, and Pres- Preston Rutherford's a friend. Actually, I think I said, you and I were commenting on one of his uh, LinkedIn posts. Yeah, he's uh, great. Yeah. He's, he's so good. He's one of the, he was on the pod really recently. So if you're listening and have not listened to the Preston Rutherford podcast episode, you got to go do that. Um, I, I'm not a Chubby's customer either, even though I got mad respect for them and love it. But there's going to be some crossover there. But yeah, it's not like just this brilliant marriage of uh, all Chubby's customers buy stoves or stove people buy Chubby's. It, it feels like kind of a different crowd. Yeah. A little and, left, but. and so I think, I think the, because I, I completely agree with you. All of those are great brands. All of those should be doing much more successful than they should. Like, I don't mean to, you know, I, I think Chubby should be divested and run as an independent apparel brand and or sold to a different apparel brand and will be incredibly successful. And it's almost one of those things of like, you know, if you set it free, it will do better. And then I think more of the point, more of the point of like where I think the miss of this original strategy was, is we're going to aggregate a bunch of DDC brands that are kind of similar and try to run that as a yeah. new portfolio yes. yeah. versus really there are three large, heavy, high AOV physical products that outdoors people will buy and a fashion retail apparel. Right. Right. Which and are like, wildly different when you when you look at it, like connection of D to C and maybe people that like to go outside. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And like we're going to kind of make it work together versus like Chubby's is a true D to C brand that should be in apparel, like that should be in physical retail because they are at, you know, they're a nine figure brand. They're at the scale and size where you know, there's only so many dollars you can torch on Meta before you have to move into retail. Right. And then I think the other brands need to be just be retail brands. Like yeah. you, yeah. the physical expense to ship, you know, like if you buy, if Brett and Jeremy buy a solo stove and an Oru Kai, you're spending 60, 80, a hundred dollars to ship something that heavy to a customer all over the country and all over the world, right? Like that's where you want to piggyback off of the retail supply chain infrastructure. Cause it was literally built to do that. Like there are, you know, REI, Home Depot, these companies ship much heavier things already to their physical locations. And so it shouldn't really be this like, you know, D to C as an innovative, disruptive channel, but really those are retail brands that will probably do much more successful and be much more profitable in a retail channel. But it feels like they're clinging to this, like we have to be D to C thesis. Got it. So, so your, your fix for solo stove is we divest Chubby's uh, and it appears actually Chubby's is, is profitable, successful, all those things, like, but like let it live and breathe and work on its own. And then, and then we're keeping solo stove and Oro kayaks and stuff. We're keeping those together or are we splitting those up potentially as well? Yeah. I don't know enough about Oro kayak and the aisle, but to me, those all make sense together. Like to me, those are all the millennial REI customer, right? Like I'm going to buy my solo stove to go on my camping trip or we're going to go paddle boarding or kayaking. And to me, those all make sense that like, you know, urban millennial who wants to get out of the city kind of branding there. I don't know enough about the specific entities, but to me, that makes more sense. And then like solo brands should be going all after that customer versus, you know, let Chubby's, you know, maybe there's another fun or another retailer that it makes sense to have that brand live under its umbrella. But I also assume it could probably, you know, their founders have also been amazing. I was at an event uh, last year where their founder shared their PL right before they exit, like up until where they exited. And it awesome. was uh, what, what, did you, did you Kyle as well. Kyle's a, that, that dude's a legend yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. So he presented, he presented on the main stage of a uh, conference that I was organizing. Oh, and, did 
Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, that's, mm-hmm. I spoke. That's where that's where I met him. Yeah, in LA. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Brett, Brett also dropped a lot of knowledge on YouTube ads at that conference yeah. as well. Um, YouTube, fun times. <laughs> but yeah, right. Like to me, that's a that's a and you know Wall Street. You know, it's not it's not a unique appearance because uni- Wall Street is a group, like is taking the stance as well as it's not by that company. I mean, there are too many of these like D to C aggregator is not the right word. Like it's not Thrasio that tried to buy right. Nikki. But AKA Brands is in a similar boat where they bought three apparel brands and then Culture Kings was a retailer. And it kind of seemed like everybody was just trying to aggregate revenue to just get to the size to go public. And I think a lot of companies are now unwinding that strategy and just going out, really mastering who are our customers, what can we get to buy them to buy more of from us and really focus on that versus this kind of like, I call it spreadsheet math. You know, we're really good at this, so let's just add this new market and that will increase our percentages by X and we'll be a big brand. Like really staying true, really staying focused, because the super successful brands are really nailing that really well and just have the patience to let that momentum build and that revenue and those profits compound over time. Yeah, and when you're just bolting on EBITDA, when you're just when you're just buying revenue and trying to piece it together with kind of a loose association that's not a recipe for synergy and you know true integration and, and ultimate you know long-term success so yeah I, re- I really like that um awesome any any other thoughts on how how, how you would fix solo it's a good question um i think honestly it's probably cut costs and ride it out like as yeah. as high as outdoor and home and goods rose it fell and it's really just a demand pull forward problem. Like, I don't think there's anything wrong with their business. I don't think that people are going to stop. Products are sound from what I hear. Products are great. Yeah. Like I don't, I I don't know anything bad about them. Like, you know, the whole Snoop thing generated a lot of buzz and that will always, you know, get a lot of thought, thought boys to give their opinions on it. But I think the, the core of the business is really strong. It just needs to literally ride out the winter. The crazy idea that I have is they should actually go raise more money or go private and scoop up all of the other more struggling outdoor brands. Because I think the, you know, it's that classic Warren Buffett. We're going to talk about Buffett a bunch of times today. But it's a classic Warren Buffett quote, right? Of like, when others are fearful, fearful, be greedy. And when, when others are greedy, be fearful. Like if outdoor is really struggling, could, you know, someone private or a larger company buy solo brands and acquire all of the other relevant brands right out the storm for two years, three years, maybe. And then you come out of the other side, you own the entire category, right? And going back to the reason why I think they should divest chubbies is, you know, if you have seven or eight products that that one core customer buys, you know, you could be Home Depot's largest outdoor recreational supplier right. or someone like that, where it's just, you know, it could be six different names, but you're still buying one entity's product. That's really difficult to do. And like I say that pretty easily, it's one of the most complicated strategies to execute. And it's actually one of the highest failure rates. But that would be my last kind of like, you know, crazy out of the box idea of where solo brands could go if they had the resources. And I actually think there's a lot of like smaller examples of that across many different industries in e-com right now, where, you know, there are 400 legging brands out there. There probably don't need to be 400 legging brands, but a legging brand could maybe get into you know, what's the workout thing that they use or what's the beauty and cosmetics and like really start to master like what's that one core customer, what's our core competency and figure out that like right ecosystem if everyone is struggling, kind of consult, I think a lot of consolidation will solve a lot of those problems. Yeah, I, consolidation is definitely going to happen. We're seeing it with DDC brands, with, with agencies as well. And, and one of the things you talked about is understanding who is our customer? What do they buy? How do we then assemble this collection of brands that are going to, you know, and products are going to meet their, their needs? And, and you made a post on LinkedIn. I'm just going to encourage everybody, you got to follow Jeremy on LinkedIn because he's awesome there. But, yeah. but one of my favorite posts recently that you, I'm just going to read it because I think it's powerful. Um, you said the best businesses stalk their customers. Don't break laws. That's an important caveat. Uh, but you need to be in their social feeds, following what they follow, consuming what they consume. You need to be in their heads more deeply than they are. Do this over and over again across the entire customer base. That's when you'll have the algorithm down. That's the only way to know what they want before they do. That's going to set you apart from everybody else. Everything else is clonable, which I love that. And so uh, any any other things you want to riff on there? But but I think that and that applies to D2C brands. That applies to agencies. That applies to software companies obsess about your customer and stalk them, know them inside and out. Yeah. Um, 
So for anyone who, so I guess I should start all of my, my all my statements on things now is this is not financial, legal, <laughs> uh, tax <laughs> advice. Don't break any laws. I was never here. Um, <laughs> but yeah, this basically came from back in my time at Lumi, which was basically Kim Kardashian's favorite selfie case. So our core ICP was 18 to 34 year old women who were wanted to basically look nicer when they took photos. Because it was basically a phone case light rails on either side. It made you look really beautiful. It was basically a, a, a photography level spotlight on your face or on anything you were taking a photo of when you went out in any dark scenario. Uh, for everyone who isn't watching this live, I am a white guy bald with a beard. So I couldn't have been farther away from that demo if possible. And actually, most of my career, I found most success tar marketing and selling products that I don't buy. And that I also don't fit the core customer base of. And so, you know, when I got asked like, Hey, how are we going to sell this to more women? I was like, cool. I don't know. Um, <laughs> and so, I mean, it's, it, it's a fun way to basically say like, do deep, deep customer research. Yeah, right? You need to go to the people, bills, right? Because you can't just rely on your, Oh yeah, I know. Cause it's me. You have to, exactly. you have to get in and know the customer and then follow the fundamentals and actually probably made you a better marketer. Yeah, it really did. I think the I think the important piece now that social media is just everyone has it and it's everywhere and every brand has some relation to it is I think when most people think of customer research, they think of like surveys or they think of like pulling data. Yeah. And really what I found to be the most successful is like I would go spend hours reading people's Instagram posts and then I would go look at their profiles to see what they posted. It was a little bit different because like I was trying to look at what photos they take to understand how they were using the product. But what I actually discovered in doing that was I actually understood like what were their interests, what were their passions. Like you know, great salespeople will will always say like I know what my clients do on a Friday night, and I think like that having that level as a marketer at scale is so important because from anything from your messaging, your positioning, we invented new products around a lot of what we did and what we found out there. Like it's so easy. All it just takes is effort. And now anytime I look at a new brand, the first two things that I do is I go look through the reviews and then I go look through their social media and what people are saying, what people are posting, and then go like dig into some of those people because it's the best, I found at least it's the best way to truly understand what the person's actually like and what the person's actually interested in. And then after a certain number of hours, you just do it enough that it's like, okay, this is our entire customer base. And I mean, we had hundreds of thousands, yeah, hundreds of thousands of customers at Lumi and like, you know, this is, you know, we get to profile level and personas, like this is what the customers like, this is what they do, this is how they talk. And then, you know, a lot of the best marketing I've ever done is copying and pasting customer quotes and Dude. then putting in ads, putting in emails, putting in all those other components. Yeah, yeah, I did, did a podcast with um, uh, the founder of, of uh, uh, Tushy and, and she was talking about Mickey, Mickey Agarwal, such a great brand. Yeah, the, the, the bidets that you, you know, attach to the, the toilet or whatever. And so like some of her best marketing uh, uh, headlines and stuff were just, were just lines taken from somebody like, uh, and, and so that one was like, uh, Tushy is eye candy and butt bliss, right? So it's, like, it's such a weird line, but it's like, it looks beautiful and you know, my butt's never been happier, whatever. Like some of those lines, you may not think of, but your customers are, and that can become like your, your best ads. And so love that strategy, stalk your customers, but don't like literally stalk them. Um, as we kind of wrap up and we're just about out of time, but, but you also had a really, really great post. I think it's worth highlighting a little bit and then people can kind of uh, dig in and look online a little bit closer, but talk to me about LVMH, uh, mm -hmm. potentially going to be the first trillion dollar product company. Who are they? What do they do? What makes them so special? Yeah. So for anyone who isn't familiar, LVMH is the ultimate luxury company. They own 75 different, what they call luxury houses, or essentially just brands. Um, and you know, most of them, Louis Vuitton, Moet and Hennessy, they bought um, Tiffany's, like the famous New York jeweler. They've also bought Fenty by Rihanna, her beauty and cosmetics brand. They're basically the luxury aggregator really like actually they are you know over 50 to 80 years they've basically just rolled up 75 different luxury companies mm -hmm. and they've just mastered this playbook because you know i don't buy any of these products so i can't really speak to it but my assumption is they have a very very clearly defined icp they really yeah. know who's going to buy their business or buy their products and they're doing 80 billion dollars in revenue it's like it's yeah it's really hard to to really like I started, you know, when these numbers started getting so big, I started looking at countries' GDPs. 
who's their their GDP, like you know, if you comp- if LVMH was a country, they would be bigger than Uzbekistan is like the seventy second largest country in the world, which like is a, a little silly. <laughs> And, and gross margins, eighty-six billion in revenue on sixty-nine percent gross, but sixty-nine percent gross margins. Insane. Yeah, absolutely insane. Like their their net income when I looked at it, their net income was more than I think like seventy or eighty percent of all of the other companies we analyzed last year combined. Wow. And so I think the really important lessons here is one, they have a really simple yet consist like hard to execute business model of they know exactly the type of company that they want to buy they wait for it to get a certain size they acquire it and then they just plug it into their machine and I, like it's really aspirational also i mean they've got you know they just traded a hundred billion dollars so when you think about their growth rate when you think about how much profit they kick off and when you think about like you know they truly are playing the compounding game of just wait every year make more sales, drive more growth. Like it is very possible that within the next decade to 15 years, they will be a trillion dollar company. Um, anyway, I, the craziest thing is I also don't think they need to acquire that many more brands. Like maybe in that 10 to 15 years, they'll be at 78, 82, maybe. But they've done a really, really good job of just consistently growing. And they have about six core categories of spirits, apparel, um, jewelry, I think they have an other category and then like luggage and travel and accessories. And they just acquire a couple brands in all of those spaces, really run them well, and then just let them go. I think the other really important piece where it's really hard coming from our end of the space where we're constantly disrupting and we're constantly trying to challenge people is they have a legacy to protect. So they have an incredible focus. And I think it's so easy to get wrapped up in we're doing this today and that looks really shiny and I'm the wor- I have worst shiny object syndrome. But like the greatest lesson I took from that is just wait 20 years. Like literally just do the one thing you're doing really, really well. Let it compound. Let it grow. And I think they really take that approach really well to everything that they do. And, you know, they're in luxury. So, yes, they can they can really support six. I mean, I don't know any other company that supports 69% gross margin at that <laughs> scale or even really at most any scale when you pass like 50, 100 million in sales. Um, but I think they've also just done a really great job of building the, the layers of their house brick by brick, layer by layer, and just being very patient with it. I know for a bunch of entrepreneurs who are like, I need to hit 50% growth, 50% growth next month. That is the worst thing to leave you with. Absolutely. But I think like really not getting distracted by the side quests, just really focusing on that core thing and sticking with it for a long period of time. Because there is really, um, you know, my Buffett quote number three, there is no greater value than compounding growth. And just really having the consistency and the patience to stay on that course is why I think like, you know, they're not attainable, but it's really something that every brand should go study, look at and think about how they can take it away for their brand. Yeah, that that focus and longer time horizon, the patience that's there, because yeah, if you're trying to ruthlessly hit a profit number or a revenue number, you're going to be really tempted to discount and do some things that that have a really short term, great short term payoff, but a, but a long term uh, net negative for the brand, and and that's the kind of type of stuff that LVMH and their premium brands don't do. And, and of course, we would we would all look at that and say, well, of course they sell luxury items, easy for them. No, 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 it's simple, but it's not easy. Like they are they are focused, and they are are uh, you know just they're cutting out everything else, and they know they know who their buyer is, and they're and they're not worried as much about short-term profits as they are, you know, protecting and building brands over the the long haul. So uh, really, really good, man. Um, So as people listen to this and like, dang, I want some more Jeremy Horowitz in my life. I need to, I need to follow him on the socials and to get on his email list. How can people connect with you? Yeah, definitely. So um, if this was helpful, if you want to hear more of my crazy thoughts and ideas, and then hopefully some helpful macro analysis of the space, Uh, just follow me on LinkedIn, join the 20,000 other e-com heads who decide that my crazy (laughs) ideas are worth reading every day. Um, I do try to post helpful stuff and tips as well. Uh, Jeremy Horowitz, H O R O W I T Z. And then if you want to get the weekly teardowns where we do go through public company P and L's, then out of the box growth strategies on how we would three X, five X, 10 X our money running those brands. Uh, just go to let's buy a biz B I Z dot X Y Z. 
uh, and subscribe to the newsletter where you'll get the all 32 P&Ls that we've analyzed so far. And you can look through all their businesses, see what all their revenue, cost of goods sold, all those other components are so you can better understand what your P&L could look like. You will be a better operator, better business mind and thinker if you get on Jeremy's newsletter. And Jeremy, man, love hanging out with you. Uh, you are a beacon of truth in a sea of craziness. Like you just, you, you speak the truth on business and D2C growth and P&Ls. And, and I love, I love what you're doing. So keep it up. And thanks for coming on the show. And uh, yeah, dude, I'm, I'm smelling like round. I'm smelling like round. Was this, is this the third podcast you've been on? At least two. Mm -hmm. So anyway, yeah. next round, we, we'll, we'll definitely schedule it here in the not too distant future. So uh, thanks for coming on. Super fun. Yeah. Appreciate it. As always, always have a great time, Brett. Awesome. And as always, thank you for tuning in. We'd love to hear from you. What would you like to hear more of on the show? Uh, and if you haven't done it so far, we'd love that review on iTunes. That's my big ask for you. Review it, share it with someone else that you think could, could use this. And with that, until next time, thank you for listening.